Hi, my name is Colin Wright, and I'm going to do a little interview here for Josh and Ryan over at The Minimalists. The tiles that make up the bathroom walls were blue, but her hair was bluer. This is the first line in your new book, Iceland, India, Interstate. It is a line that introduces us to Yona, the Icelandic girl with whom you share center stage throughout the rest of the book. You break a few of your own rules to spend additional time with her on three continents. Did you ever expect to spend a year with the same woman? How much do personal rules play a role in your life, and how willing are you to adjust your rules? Well, um, the answer to that first question, uh, did I expect to spend uh, a year with the same woman? Honestly, no. It's, it's not that I have anything against long-term relationships. I've, I've had plenty in the past, but my lifestyle just simply doesn't allow for it most of the time. Uh, so I've, I've kind of grown accustomed in the past three years or so to having shorter term relationships which are also excellent uh, and I've found that shorter relationships with uh, kind of time limits really make you appreciate the relationship more and make you appreciate the other person more and as long as both people are fully aware of what's going on and are communicating with each other clearly and uh, making sure that nobody's left out of what's going on in the other person's head then it usually works very well. I've, I've had some of the best relationships in my entire life actually be uh, as, as short as a week or uh, in the case of the relationship with Yona last about a year so the duration doesn't seem to matter too much. It's really what you make of it. And uh, the, the way that I tend to do things these days with that time limit tends to make me really appreciate the time that I've got a whole lot more. For that second question, how much do personal rules play in my life and how willing am I to adjust those rules? My rules are very important to me. I am not a religious person. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm somebody for whom uh, personal philosophy, morality, and ethics are all incredibly important. And I'm, I make sure to constantly reassess what my personal ethics and morality and philosophies are. I learn a whole lot about other people and other things and other cultures when I travel, but I learn a whole lot about myself as well and kind of what I believe based on new information. And I, I make sure to be constantly readjusting that, constantly taking what I'm learning and applying it directly to my life and how I live. Uh, honestly, what I'm doing wouldn't be quite so interesting or important to me if, if I wasn't able to do that. But because I'm able to start from scratch every time I move, uh, I, it seems silly. It would seem silly not to take advantage of that situation and uh, you know change along the way as well. Your last memoir-style book, My Exile Lifestyle, seemed to be a post-minimalism book. In other words, you had embraced a minimalist lifestyle for a few years, and that first book documented what you were able to do with your life after embracing such a lifestyle. Iceland India Interstate follows a similar motif, but takes it further, what I'd call post-post-minimalism. What has been different in terms of writing these books, and how has your view on minimalism changed or evolved over the years? Um, well, I guess you could say that's right. I mean, honestly, when I first started out uh, reducing my possessions and stuff, I had no idea what minimalism was, and it wasn't until I started blogging and kind of uh, keeping track of what I owned and what was important to me in such in a more public way that I actually discovered there was a thing called minimalism, and it was kind of a, a budding new trend at the time on the online space. It's It's been something that's been around for thousands of years, but... Uh, on the internet, the, in its current incarnation, it was still kind of a new thing. So um, it, it wasn't something that I heard of until then. And then I, I kind of took to it with gusto, and I, I used the term and embraced it, and it seemed to fit a lot of what I believed, and it, it still does, honestly. I would still tell people that I'm a minimalist or that minimalism is an important part of my philosophy. Uh, it's not the most important thing about what I am and who I am and what I believe, but it's definitely a key component to a lot of what I believe, uh, especially in terms of of lifestyle choice and what I focus my time on and what I invest myself in. I am incredibly careful in how I spend my time and how I spend my money and other resources and energy. Um, I am acutely aware of <laughs> exactly how short a time I have to, uh, to achieve everything that I want to achieve, to do everything that I want to do, and how much time before I started being aware of this kind of thing I wasted on things that simply did not matter, did not make me happy, things I felt I had to do. So in terms of that, uh, minimalism has kind of evolved to the point where it's less about just stuff, still a key component, but less about that, not only about that, and more and more about how I spend my time and my personal, my human resources. Um, that is something that affects me every single day and something I'm constantly reassessing and reevaluating because it's it, it's kind of a, 
a key part of everything that I do. And as somebody especially who leads kind of a non-traditional lifestyle, I have the ability to quickly change things that I'm doing if I find that they're not optimal. So if I find myself investing my time in something that doesn't make me happy and something that doesn't really do anything for me or move me closer to a goal that I find to be important, I, I'm able to quickly change it. So, so that reassessment is good. No matter what stage you're at, no matter where you're at in life, whatever it happens to be, it'll get you closer to where you want to be. Uh, and I'm finding myself in a position to quickly, quickly change constantly. And that, that's kind of the role that minimalism has uh, found in my life, where it's more of a filter than anything. Since embracing minimalism, you've mentioned that the things you own now add ma much more value to your life. Can you talk about the role of material possessions in your life and how they add value to what you do? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Honestly, like everybody, <laughs> everybody in the first world at least, um, consumerism was a huge part of who I was for a long time. I just had to spend my money on something. I had to have more stuff to prove who I was to uh, to have, hopefully have those associations rub off on me. Uh, <laughs> certain corporations, certain celebrities, certain music, certain foods, whatever it happened to be, um, I, I did that exact same thing. And I, and I still do. I mean, it's almost unavoidable, really, unless you live in the mountains somewhere and build your own hut out of found materials or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but material possessions to me are enablers now. They're accessories as opposed to something of key vital importance. I like to have things that make me happy and allow me to do what I love to do in, a, uh, in an easier way, a more efficient or effective way. Um, without a laptop, for example, my job would be significantly more difficult. Uh, without a decent laptop, <laughs> my job would be significantly more difficult. Um, and the better laptop that I have, the, the more opportunities I have to do things, the more um, processing power I have to work with if I want to do some graphic design work, or e even just ease of use. Um, when I'm writing, I'm more likely to sit down and use something that I consider to be beautiful, something that I consider to be easy to type on, something that, I, that doesn't lock up all the time, or freeze, or shut itself down, or whatever. So, having things uh, certain things is actually uh, quite important to me. It's just, it's fewer and fewer things that I feel like I need. Um, I could figure out a way to do what I do without a laptop. It would be incredibly difficult, and it would be a real bitch to have to go find a, uh, like a coffee shop with a computer I could use every time I want to publish something, because I'm publishing constantly. Uh, and to have to handwrite everything, uh, or even just try to conceive of it before I arrive at the coffee shop if I'm not allowed to have a notebook either. Uh, Whatever it happened to be, a laptop improves my life. And there's several other things in my life, too, that I think add to my life rather than subtracting it. And they don't distract from other things that I consider to be important. Now, there are other things, though, that uh, I've valued in the past and still do every once in a while find myself uh, really ogling some new device or <laughs> some article of clothing or something that, that doesn't really add anything. And in fact, it distracts me from things that do matter, uh, matter to me. Uh, Everyone has different priorities, and I try to work very hard so that every day I'm more aware of what my priorities are, what things I actually get high, high levels of results, high levels of happiness from. And as I focus more and more on that, I get happier and happier, and I'm able to achieve more, and I feel better about what I achieve and the work I create. Uh, so in that way, stuff can add value to your life. And as long as you're a very meticulous curator, if you're very careful and don't let any bullshit into your collection, essentially, stuff that's just there to be there, uh, it, it, it's amazing how great you feel. And, you know, there's a little bit of leeway, too, for things that you can try out and see how they work in your life as well. Um, but I, I encourage people all the time just to start like with their wardrobe or something and just get rid of stuff that they haven't worn in a couple months. And the feeling that you get from that is is just a nice taste of what you get when you do something a little bit more extreme, where you start applying that same uh, filter to the rest of your life, and suddenly you have all this time, all these freed-up resources, all this uh, freed-up mental attention to spend on other things, and it is just uh, it's an incredibly great feeling. So, so you know, stuff is important, but uh, choosing the right stuff is just as, if not more, important. Ryan and I recently teamed up with Tom Chambers and you to form Asymmetrical Press, a publishing company and community that embraces new technologies, methods, and ideas to improve the quality of published work. Please talk about how you came upon this idea and why you decided to make it a reality. Well, I have tried several different business models and several different concepts to try to make independent publishing a little bit easier and to make it more successful and to help people produce better work. 
Uh, I had a business not too long ago, a little over a year ago, that was still in operation called eBookling, where I tried to create a platform to compete with uh, Amazon and Smashwords and such. And, but we had a couple ideas that I think we did better than other um, currently available platforms. But we were leapfrog technologically, and frankly, it it's coming to the point where just having another store is not going to fix anything because it's using the same model and even if you have cool new ideas it, it doesn't really change anything dramatic about the way that the industry works so I wanted to come up with a new approach I guess to to the issue and the issue is that um, independent work is generally seen as lower quality than legacy published work and that's something that's not always true it's, it's sometimes true but the, the real issue is not that the work is bad, it's just that the, um, the delivery of the work is not as, as good as legacy publishers are able to do. Legacy publishers uh, being, you know, like the big six publishing and such, they'll take a long, long time to work on a book and they will run it through several editors and they'll have professional designers design it and they'll have professional printers print it and I mean they really do a good job that's what they've been doing for generations and indie publishing comes along and it's got a bunch of authors who are incredible writers involved with it but that doesn't mean that their work is going to be as well edited or well designed or well delivered or well promoted as the the work coming out of these legacy publishers so Asymmetrical press, the idea is to get a bunch of people who have experience within publishing online and publishing in the new world of publishing using new technologies and uh, the, the new methods, I guess, that, that have been discovered since, since we started using the internet to sell books that legacy publishers aren't always doing very well. So it's kind of an asymmetrical advantage to uh, being a solo publisher in this case. Uh, so I, I contacted Ryan and Josh and Tom and said, hey guys, you guys all produce work that I really respect and I would love to work with you on this. I think our personalities mesh well. Here's the idea. And uh, <laughs> what it comes down to is essentially creating a publishing house, not, not so much like a legacy publishing house, but the same idea, but instead of owning people's work the way that they do, we, we don't pay up front and say, we're going to own your work and we'll pay you a little bit after you've earned back that initial money we've paid you. Uh, we invest in them, and we take what we know how to do. We take what we do for ourselves, essentially, and uh, commit it to their projects, commit it to these authors that we take under our label, or the it could just be an isolated project, maybe just a novel instead of all of an author's work, and we run it through the process. We get it edited, we get it well-designed, we get it well-marketed and publicized, and we try to help them create an asset. And as investors, we, we take 20%, say, instead of taking the entire book and then giving them 10% of what's made from it. And that's something that I think will be very appealing to independent publishers. That's, that's something that would have been appealing to me if somebody would have come to me early on before I knew how to do all of this. Uh, if, if they would have come to me and said, we'll handle all the rest, you can just write, uh, and all we're going to take is 20% of the, uh, the profits from it, I, I would have leaped on it like just like that. So that's what we're hoping for. We're hoping to be able to take what we know and to share it with other people. Uh, one, through asymmetrical press, where we actually invest in other people's work, and then the asymmetrical community, which is kind of a more foundational thing, where we're taking what we know and trying to teach people. So even without us taking any stock in anybody else's work, without uh, taking 20% or without investing in their work, we are trying to share that knowledge, uh, trying to raise the bar of the independent publishing scene, because there's so much potential there, and it's just... It's, it's not quite there yet, though. Um, these people who are amazing writers producing amazing work, they're busy becoming even better writers producing even better work, and there's no reason they should have to know how to be a business person or should have to know how to be an editor or have to know how to be a book cover designer. But if they want to learn, then we're going to try to teach them. And we're going to have a series of classes that we're going to be each teaching, and we're going to have a, a series of posts that are just simple how-tos, everything from just how to get your book up on the Amazon Kindle to how to design a nice cover to you know dealing with all the technical difficulties that come up. These are the things, the hurdles that we want to remove. And it's not something that anybody's really doing yet, not in any um, well-publicized mainstream way. So... We're hoping that the asymmetrical community will become that resource where there's a lot of good evergreen content that people can come back to again and again, and that content can evolve over time as more independent uh, publishers become you know, really good, really good business people keen at what they're doing. Then we're also hoping to instill a sense of sharing with the community and giving back to it where it's not a matter of necessarily going and buying everybody else's work, but helping them learn what you learned as well. That's what we've tried to do all along, and that's, that's one of the values that we're trying to instill along the way. 
And finally, it looks like Josh and Ryan want me to read an excerpt from the new book, Iceland, India, Interstate. Uh, quick context, it looks like this is a section from when I, Yona and I were visiting my brother in Minneapolis, and we found this epic game called Ket, which I was just lusting over. Uh, so here goes. One of the downsides of my lifestyle is that there are often things you want but can't have. Or rather, you could have them, but the trade-off wouldn't be worth it. In the case of Ket, which I took to calling Egyptian laser chess, buying the game would have resulted in me needing to buy another bag to carry it in, which would have resulted in another bag to carry everywhere I went. Alternatively, I could have bought it and shipped it to somewhere, but as soon as I have a somewhere to keep spare doodads, there's little incentive to be as careful about what I buy. I could just ship any old junk there, and there it would likely remain, devaluing in the meantime and devaluing everything else stored in that somewhere as well, because of the opportunity cost I would have to pay to use it over the other things I gave into and shipped. Then again, this is one of the aspects of minimalism that I like best, that it makes purchasing decisions quite easy. There are many things out there that I would like to have, but very few that I need. Knowing exactly how much real estate you have to work with, in my case, the space inside my bag, gives you a very precise scale with which to measure any potential acquisition. Of course, this isn't for everyone, but I would venture that most people would benefit from refocusing their attention on the things that really matter to them, and those few incredibly important things in life that really, truly make them happy. When your focus is there, you also tend to focus your time, energy, and resources on those important things, increasing your happiness and decreasing the amount of stuff you buy out of habit or boredom. So again, my name is Colin Wright, and my new book is called Iceland, India, Interstates, and it comes out Monday, June 4th, uh, and the, the new business is Asymmetrical Press in the Asymmetrical Community, which I started with Josh, Ryan, and Tom Chambers, so give that a look when you get the chance. Thank you so much for having me and for watching this little video.